Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name's Lauren Taylor, and I'm the program producer here at the Wheeler Centre. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on unceded sovereign land. The event broadcast comes to you from the Wheeler Centre on the lands of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and to all the elders of all the communities this event reaches. Thanks so much for joining us for this special digital event and what promises to be a really special hour of readings from some brilliant new and emerging voices. Tonight's event, of course, is the next big thing in partnership with the Wheeler Centre and the 2021 Emerging Writers Festival. The Emerging Writers Festival have done such an incredible job uh, transitioning at the very last minute to an online only format for the festival this year in response to the ongoing challenges of COVID-19. A huge thank you to those that have worked so hard behind the scenes to bring it all together and to ensure everyone can still participate in and access the festival as safely and as comfortably as possible. The Wheeler Centre's long-running series, The Next Big Thing, provides a rare opportunity to introduce readers to writers and to hear those writers read their wonderful work. Tonight, in the annual Emerging Writers Festival edition of The Next Big Thing, we've curated a selection of writers for you tonight that we believe are truly voices to watch. You'll hear readings from some of Australia's best emerging literary voices, including 2020 Next Chapter recipient Sam Elkin, author of Emotional Female, Yumiko Kadota, and VoiceWorks contributor, Michaela Ermida. I'm going to introduce each writer as briefly as possible and in turn let them tell you about what they've been working on. Our first writer tonight is the wonderful Sam Elkin. Sam has been a Wheeler Centre Next Chapter Fellow and his essays have been published in The Griffith Review, Overland, Kill Your Darlings and Bent Street. Sam is also a radio maker and has produced a number of radio shows, including Transgender Warriors, Transdemic, and 3 Triple R's Queer View Mirror. This year, Sam received an Australian Society of Authors mentorship, and he's currently working on a debut memoir. It's my pleasure to introduce Sam Elkin. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Elkin. I am a writer and a radio maker, and I live in Footscray. And this is a work in progress from an essay collection that I'm working on and hope to finish one day. Um, the, the working title for my essay collection is Just Passing Through, and this is one of the essays from it um, that is a work in progress called Genetic Full Stop. I hope you enjoy it. Every six months, I get a letter from an IVF clinic in Sydney telling me that I have 10 days to pay another $250 to keep my embryos on ice for another six months. When I see the image of a little white sperm penetrating a purple egg on the otherwise bland envelope jutting out of my letterbox, I'm seized by panic. It's not the money, per se, which I transfer immediately, no matter how diabolical my personal financial situation is. It's the reminder of my indecision, the shame of having started the complicated and expensive task of creating a new life, only to get cold feet halfway through. Now I stand hesitating at the precipice of the reproductive diving board ladder, unsure whether to jump off or to quietly descend. I've been not making this decision for about five years now. If I'd actually carried one of these embryos to term, they'd be about to start primary school. Instead, the four of them sit in a lab freezer in Sydney, waiting to me to decide their fate or for an accident to terminate them. Will they get their chance to grow in my body? Will they find a new loving home in another childless person's womb, one who is more certain for their desire for children? Will they be sacrificed to medical science to help reproductive scientists learn more about the art of creating life, to die so that future generations can live? Or will they just sit there and slowly disintegrate, a marker of the high price of my indecision? I feel for these embryos. It's a hard thing to admit to. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I don't care for the pro-lifers who try and shame people for accessing safe abortions by banging on about unborn fetuses. And these aren't even fetuses, they're just embryos, technically blastocysts, comprising of no more than 100 cells. They're like half an idea for a short story that you haven't even attempted to write yet. I feel for my ex-partner, Grace, too 
who paid for us to go on this journey together, courtesy of her exclusive junior doctor's low interest credit card. When they get their first job as hospital interns, some doctors pay off their debts incurred just to get their degree with these cards. Some buy tasteful, work-appropriate clothing, and others buy a new car to get them to and from their endless night shifts in style. Grace bought us the chance to have our own family. I took that chance that she lovingly offered and ultimately destroyed it. We were living in Sydney when we decided to have a baby. I'd moved up there from Melbourne to be with her. We immediately went from being long distance lovers to live in partners, sharing a shambolic inner Sydney terrace with two brilliant, stressed out graduate history students. There was a gaping hole in the upstairs bathroom that dripped water into the sink below. In classic lesbian fashion, one of our housemates was Grace's ex-girlfriend. Grace and I moved into our own place and within a few months, leaving Grace's ex and flatmate to deal with the hole and the death throes of their PhDs. We moved into a white townhouse that we soon christened the cigarette butt due to its discoloured exterior that I assumed was the cumulative effect of the petrol fumes from the busy road that we lived upon. Our landlord had no cause to freshen it up in Sydney's very tight rental market. After a few uncertain months on Centrelink, I got a job working as a union organiser for nursing home staff. Grace was at work all the time at the local hospital and I often wouldn't see her for days except to make her a quick cup of coffee as she left for the day. I didn't really have any friends in Sydney and I didn't really fit in with my colleagues either. A bunch of practical, no-nonsense nurse types more interested in talking about clean eating and Zumba than the things I was keen to hear about, like the green bands in Woolloomooloo. I spent those first months anxiously driving a fleet car around Sydney's congested highways to nursing homes everywhere from Mosman to Minto to organising meetings of nursing assistants, most of whom were casual and thus too nervous to keep their jobs to turn up. I felt like a fish out of water and a poor hire for the organisation, truth be told, since I didn't look, sound or know much about the lives of the workers that I was trying to organise. I could barely even drive confidently enough to follow the GPS to get to the meeting I'd organised on time. So, it was in this context that I decided that Grace and I should have a baby. Grace had always planned on having children one day, so much that she owned a whole collection of baby names books, which she'd like to read in bed to unwind after a long hard shift at the hospital. She'd be the breadwinner, of course, given how career-minded she was, and I'd have a legitimate reason to quit my job and become a shut-in. I whimsically thought it would be also an opportunity to write my long-discussed but never-realised novel in between the baby's nap times. Grace was from a wealthy, tight-knit family who I was certain would spare no expense to ensure that we had the best of everything. Sure, I didn't love Sydney like Grace did, but then I'd been glad to leave Melbourne too, full of exes and memories of my tumultuous 20s. So when we settled on the idea, we set about to decide upon the practicalities. Since we both had wombs, we were going to have to get the sperm from somewhere else. I had a strong preference for using a known donor due to my dad's experiences with adoption. My dad's unmarried mother walked in front of a car after he was born in 1958 and he'd spent time in an orphanage before being adopted to a couple with no children. His adopted father also died within the first year of my dad's arrival and so he was raised by his adopted mother Dulcie, herself an aged care nurse, until she put him in a boarding school for maladjusted children at age 12 due to his defiant nature. He stayed there until he finished school and enrolled in technical college where he met my mother. The two of them spent a considerable amount of time trying to great, um, find out about his origins. His search came to a head when he knocked on the door of his deceased mother's brother-in-law, door, who had since divorced his first wife and then remarried. He said he didn't know who my father was and promptly shut the door. My dad had continued to search unsuccessfully for his biological father throughout his life. His experiences meant that he didn't know a lot about parenting and he frankly didn't do a great job of parenting my brother and I. I, of course, cannot say how much of my dad's cruel and selfish behaviour can be attributed to the pain of him not being able to discover his biological origins, but it had nonetheless made me extremely hesitant to create a life that could be scarred by this kind of psychic pain. I felt very awkward about asking any males I knew to be a donor, since it would inherently draw attention to the fact that I myself was not a biological male. Despite being born female, I've strongly identified with the male sex since I can remember. 
I insisted my friends and family call me Sam from age five onwards instead of my female birth name and had a habit of telling other small children that I met in playgrounds that I'd be having a sex change when I turned 18. That did not happen. Instead, I did my best to be myself given the choices that were available to me at the time. I was thus a tomboy in primary school, a grungy teenager in band tees and jeans in high school, and a lesbian at university. I found inhabiting that identity uncomfortable, but I hadn't discovered terms like genderqueer or non-binary at this stage. It was many, many more years until I found the courage to medically affirm my gender, which is all just to say that discussing the procuring of sperm from third parties made me profoundly uncomfortable which is probably why instead of having a calm and respectful conversation with somebody, I blurted out my request for sperm to a group of gay guys that I didn't know particularly well at a party. Some of them quite sensibly ignored me altogether and kept dancing, but a couple of others were sent into deep introspection, perhaps lost in thought at their chances of starting their own family one day. A nice young man called David told me that he'd think about it. When I woke up the next day with a dry mouth and a headache, feeling humiliated at having blundered into this sensitive topic at the worst possible times, I vowed to never raise this with them again. Grace then suggested that we ask my brother, since she only has a sister. My brother, why didn't I think of that? Of course, I had thought about it. He's just two years older than me, has children of his own, lives in another state in Australia and is in relatively good health. We've always managed to have polite conversations, which does a serviceable job of masking our strained relationship due to our family being mired in extreme dysfunction. We hadn't had an honest conversation about anything since we were teenagers. So the idea of trying to have a deep and meaningful conversation about my desire to be a parent and how he could help me by altruistically donating his sperm did make me feel anxious. I'd made it my life's mission to never rely on a family member, so I was certain that he would continue to disappoint me. And that's the end of the excerpt that I'm reading today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at Sam Elkhorn. Um, otherwise, enjoy this event. Next up is our VoiceWorks contributor this evening, Michaela Omida. Michaela is a Filipino New Zealander creative non-fiction writer, performer and honours student at the University of Melbourne, where she's also the Women's Officer for 2021. Michaela is currently completing a thesis on the performativity of public protests during a pandemic. Her writing can be found in VoiceWorks and Judy's Punch. Please welcome Michaela Amita. Hi there, my name is Michaela Amita. I use she, her pronouns, and sometimes I write creative nonfiction and perform on stage, but that's kind of being sidelined at the moment as I write my honors thesis. Wish me luck. <laughs> I'm incredibly honored and I'm honestly still wrapping my head around the opportunity I've been given to read my creative nonfiction piece called Extraction that was recently published in the 121st edition of VoiceWorks, which was centered on the theme of Root. Um, to provide some context first, this piece is incredibly important to me. Um, it was the first time I ever submitted my writing to an external publication and somehow got accepted and paid for my writing, which is amazing. Um, and before I start, I just really want to say a brief and sincere thank you to Maria Tamarkin. Um, she was the, um, tutor for the creative nonfiction writing elective that I took on a whim last year. And without her, I genuinely do not think I would have found the courage to have submitted my writing to somewhere else. I'd always held myself back because compared to a lot of people my age, and I'm surrounded by a lot of young, talented writers who've been published so many times, um, I always felt like I started too late. And I built up this distinction between academic writing and creative writing that I thought I couldn't overcome. I always thought, oh, you might be good at writing, um, at deconstructing texts in English, but when it comes to reassembling all those techniques and structures you learned about into something new and creative and innovative, not so much. <laughs> and Maria helps me so much to unlearn all of that. So I'm really thankful to her, yeah. Um, so the idea for this actually came to me in the summer of 2020, which if most of you can remember and the time slip that is COVID-19, 
was really charged. There was the black summer bushfires and then the outbreak of the pandemic and then a slew of anti-Asian racism. But at the same time, Parasite had just won Best Picture. And for me personally, I had just been fortunate enough to visit the Philippines for the first time in 20 years. Um, as I'm 21, it was like the first time I'd... It was like a homecoming to a home that I never knew. Um, especially since all my life I'd felt really disconnected from my Filipino heritage because of my inability to speak Tagalog. Um, only very recently have I found myself calling myself Filipino instead of Asian for reasons that I'll talk about later. So I first started writing it um, because I couldn't sleep for two reasons. First, for jet lag, and second, because of my wisdom tooth pain. And it's through the sensory memory of wisdom tooth pain that I started writing because I couldn't stop thinking about it as a metaphor um, for kind of unpacking my my complicated relationship to my ethnic identity, um, growing pains, and monolingualism. So without further ado, I guess I'll start. I'm always able to find my place in this magazine because my piece was published on hot pink with this really gorgeous illustration. And coincidentally, purple is my favorite color, so it's really fortunate that this was the edition I was published in. But yeah. <clears throat> Third molars, otherwise referred to as wisdom teeth, are generally regarded as useless remnants of prehistoric times, from when humans had primarily subsisted on raw meat and coarse roots and leaves. They were first made purposeless with the invention of cooking tools to soften our food, and then problematic with the rapid development of our brains hundreds of millennia ago that shortened our jaws where our teeth rested. Stolen of space and overpopulated, human mouths in the modern age became crowded. But the mouth, as the locus of speech, can be crowded with things other than teeth. Language, for instance. I often experience this firsthand in my rare and clumsy attempts to speak Tagalog. Counterintuitively, discarding the broadness of my natural Western American accent, I slip into the sweet staccato of Japanese, of which I have rudimentary knowledge. But this is at odds with the lilting cadence of my mother tongue. I should savor rather than clip my vowels, let them pour out from my open throat like water. This Frankensteinian butchery and assemblage of sound can be ascribed to an absence of skill or practice, but I wonder if there's something more hollow, more rotten at the root. On the subject of multilingualism, Benny Norton, a professor of literacy and language education, writes, the minute you speak to someone, you're engaging in an identity negotiation. Apparently, a change of language comes with a change of self. Every transplantation of tongue relies on your perception of the culture it was originally attached to, and of yourself in relation to it. Perhaps, in the ruptures of my own speech, I communicated to other Filipinos my own failure to wholly accept my heritage. My ontological reasoning was this. I didn't look white, so I must at least be Asian, right? That discursive monolith under which all peoples of the continent are assimilated. But I didn't feel Filipino. Like my wisdom teeth, the family trip I took to the Philippines was a painful rite of passage. It marked both my 20th birthday and the first time I had visited since infancy. But while blood and bone bound me to this place, I could see my wide cheekbones and pointed chin reflected on the faces around me, I was unable to pass the threshold of language. All my friends and family told me not to speak English there. This was for my own safety, they said, as I would out myself as a foreigner in what, to all appearances, should be my native country. But as a monolingual, this translated into an entreaty for silence. Consequently, I was rendered a mute sightseer. Voiceless, I instead became attuned to the voices of others. Often, I would overhear snatches of conversation in Tagalog around me. The familiar intonations of these linguistic and cultural in encounters pricked my ears, despite my inability to grasp and decipher sound into words. In New Zealand and Australia, where I was born and raised respectively, this was a game. I would select the most trivial phrases and present them to my friends and family as gag gifts, designed to poke fun and disguise the shallowness of my language. But here... I was futile in my monolingualism, entrapped in English. Suddenly, it wasn't so funny. I came to think of my mouth as an organ of oppression. The pangs in my gums echo across space-time. With every pulsation, I am reminded of my lack. I'm unable to leave my state of injury, even in Australia. Frustrated with aching, I lie awake and fantasize about an extraction of white. I long to slip my fingers inside my mouth, and catch flesh like a fish hook, slicing through tissue to excavate the foreign object growing from within.
<clears throat> For many Filipino families, tertiary education is seen as the passport to success. English was inextricably bound to this process. The colonization of the Philippines by the United States in the 1890s, immediately after Spain's 300-year rule, ensured its, ensured its continuing primacy as the official language of government and education. This may have something to do with my father and his mother's decision that I be raised as an English speaker without any knowledge of Tagalog. It was at first a shield. I assimilated into New Zealand without the Filipino accent that would have made me a target in the schoolyard. Later, it was a sonic smokescreen my parents could hide behind to have private conversations and full view of my sister and I. But finally, it became the precondition for academic distinction. In high school, I was identified, recognized, and celebrated for my proficiency in the colonial speech that had bleached my childhood. The other students called me the walking spell check, the human dictionary, and finally, the English god, <laughs> the latter most bestowed upon me by the valedictorian of my year. I remember gripping the chain-linked fence bordering our school's parking lot in embarrassment when I heard this. Such flattery, in the land of the tall poppy syndrome, often worked to alienate me from my peers. But I will admit to a cruel rush of pleasure that used to come during award ceremonies, one that stirred deep in my belly and made me hold my head an inch higher. My mother once told me about the shock she'd seen unfold in the faces of nearby parents at seeing an Asian accept the prize for highest achieving student in English. Before the novelty had inevitably worn off, I imagined the weight of the collective white gazes on me as I walked down the aisle to the stage. Welcomed it even. On their own turf, I had sharpened my monolingualism into a weapon, ready to be brandished at any time. It was a checkmate I held back on the tip of my tongue in defensive anticipation of any racist provocation. I may not be white, but I can speak your language better than you. Skipping ahead again. One short month later, a video goes viral and circulates everywhere on the news. In it, a pair of international students from the University of Melbourne are attacked by two Caucasian women, unprovoked and broad daylight. With one outbreak comes another. COVID-19, the so-called Chinese virus, had incubated another pandemic of anti-Asian racism in the West. I was struck by the realization that no matter how well I spoke their language or excelled at their schools, I would never be wholly accepted. My appearance would always be an optical barrier, marked with what cultural and performance studies scholar Jacqueline Lowe calls the bodily inscriptions of racial alterity. Never mind that those two girls were Chinese, while I'm Filipino. Never mind that we and our experiences are not commensurable. We are bound together by the violence of the white gaze. In the same way that I celebrate Asian excellence, I suffer Asian pain. English is turned against me, a double-edged sword. It pierces my being, a sonic screech reverberating across history as they screamed at me, go back to your country. So I go back. Along the tides of memory, I drift to the powder white beach of Tambasan. It is neither the teeming, sprawling Manilan metropolis of my mother's side, nor the rolling green province of Nova Ecija from which my father came, but it's somewhere. Here and then, I stand on the margin of sea and land by myself. Alone, silence can seem like a choice rather than an imperative. Once again, I listen. But this time, in the quiet rolling of the waves, I hear the siren call that brought me to the Philippines in the first place a whispered promise of belonging, of ontological resolution. The memory of my father's voice puts it into words. After seeing the eczema that had ravaged my face and body with the coming of summer, he gently told me, come to the water. My skin was breaking apart faster than it could heal. I was an open, walking wound. A similar metaphor is used by Wendy Brown in States of Injury, where she uses the notion of wounded attachments to write about the logics of pain and identity politics. She argues that attempts to redress the psychic injury caused by one's attachment to historical harm and injustice only reinscribe the social positions of injured and injurer. Instead, we need to recognize pain in order to overcome rather than become it. On the shore, I hesitate at the edge, despite how my father had vouched for the restorative qualities of the seawater. I knew it would sting. Everything that healed burned at first. Closing my eyes, I instinctively think of Catholic platitudes, one inescapable remnant of, Filipino, of my Filipino heritage, and envision a cleansing, a baptism of holy fire. I think of absolution, dissolution, and coming out of the water whole, the pain neutralized long enough to begin healing, no matter how long it took. Little by little, word by word, I learned to read, write, and speak Tagalog properly, and while I had to swallow the bitter, bitter reality that I'd probably never achieved the fluency of a native speaker, it would be a start. 
finally, I weighed in. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed. Our final guest for the evening is Yumiko Kadota. Yumiko is a medical doctor from Sydney. She resigned from public hospital work after experiencing burnout and now works in medical education and private health. Yumiko is also a debut author and her incredible memoir, Emotional Female, is a passionate account of the toxic culture of bullying and overwork that junior doctors can experience in the workplace as part of their training. It also details the challenges that women of colour face in the public health system, particularly in the male-dominated field of surgery. Please welcome Yumiko Kadota. This is my book, Emotional Female, published this year. It's a memoir about my time as a junior doctor and medical student um, over the, the last 15 years of my life. The passage I'm going to read out tonight is from childhood. It was when I'd moved to England for the first time, having grown up in Singapore. Chapter three, your English is really good. 2001, London. During our time in Singapore, Hajime was offered a few opportunities for work back in Japan, but as a family, we'd always protested. My sisters and I loved our life in Singapore and didn't want to leave, especially not for Japan. Even though we looked Japanese, we were often reminded of that because people couldn't pronounce our names properly. We didn't always identify with Japanese culture. Besides, the resentment of having to complete Japanese education by correspondence put us off. Eventually, though, my father got a posting to London that he couldn't refuse. I was 13 at the time. So, in June 2001, the Kadota family left tropical Singapore, a degree above the equator, for London, 51 degrees north. My sisters and I had never been to Europe, and we were rather captivated by the thought of experiencing northern hemisphere seasons. We travelled to the UK via Japan to visit our grandparents. First, our mother side in Tokyo and then to Shikoku Island. Our grandma Naoko in Tokyo welcomed us home with her cooking. She made the best potato salads I'd ever known. She did this hard thing with hard-boiled eggs, crumbling the egg yolk over the salad as a garnish. That was my favourite bit. I loved how it made the potato salad look like a field of puffy dandelions. The next morning, Grandma Naoko gathered us around the kitchen table and held up a spoon. Okay, little chickens, you each get one spoon and we will smash the eggshells. My sisters and I looked at each other and smiled. We smashed them into little pieces, not knowing what it was for, but going for it anyway because it was fun. Now, she said, we will paint the little pieces. You can choose any colour you like. We still weren't sure where this was headed, but followed her lead. After we finished painting, Grandma gave us each a piece of A3 paper. Now we each make a mosaic, she announced. Use your imagination and create a picture using the coloured pieces. And just like that, Grandma Naoko got us creating art out of leftover eggshells from last night's dinner. She was an amazing woman. She always had ways of making something out of nothing. She'd led a simple life after the war and wanted to teach us that we didn't need much to have fun together. After a week in Tokyo, we traveled south to Shikoku Island. June in Japan was humid, the hot air sticking to us like a flimsy shower curtain. The cicadas were complaining too. Even though I was getting a bit too old to be catching cicadas, being in Japan made me enjoy childhood pastimes. Our grandpa, Ji-chan, came with us to the local park. We carried nets and plastic cages, listening to the stridulations swarming around us. Look, Ji-chan, I caught one, I yelled, running over to my grandfather with a large brown cicada in my net. Ji-chan laughed in delight. It was one of those wholesome chortles. Wow, what a catch, Yumi-chan, he said, his bushy white eyebrows raised up high. On the walk home... Ji-chan and I had our arms around each other's shoulders. I had a special bond with Ji-chan because we were both born in the year of the rabbit. 
Japanese people have a preoccupation with the zodiac animals and the character traits they're associated with. Those born under the sign of the rabbit are thought to be sensitive, compassionate, and have a strong memory. It was like Ji-chan and I had our own little club, just us, the two rabbits. The next day, Ji-chan took us to the river for a swim, a very different experience from the barrenness of Singapore. I couldn't believe how clear the water was. My sisters and I lay on our backs, linking arms like a raft of otters. Summer in Chikoku was splendid. The sun was shining between huge candy floss clouds, the chorus of cicadas was as rambunctious as ever, and the stream was comfortably tepid like a daydream. Flanked between my sisters, I knew that life would always be okay because we had each other. We would be just fine starting our new lives in England. After a few weeks in Japan, it was time for us to say goodbye to our grandparents and continue our journey. I wasn't scared or nervous. My sisters and I thought London was cool and we couldn't wait to discover our new city. We arrived in London with sun-browned skin and matching goggle tans on our faces. It was supposed to be summer in Britain, but we were wearing cardigans. We settled right into the northwestern suburb of Hendon, which was nicknamed the JJ community, so-called because there were lots of Japanese and Jewish families. For the first time in our lives, we lived in a house with a garden. Compared to the drab unit we'd had in Singapore, the house in Hendon felt palatial. Mariko and I shared a room, and Eriko got her own because she had trouble sleeping. Yoshiko was particularly excited about the roses and the lemon tree in the backyard. We spent the first few weeks exploring our neighbourhood and figuring things out, such as where we'd get the groceries. We found it strange that there was so much Indian food in England. Every supermarket seemed well stocked with microwave meals of chicken tikka masala. There was plenty of Indian food in Singapore, but Yoshiko cooked every day, so we hadn't had much of it before. Imagine going to England to discover Indian food. I thought that was a bit funny. We would be catching the Northern Line every day to go to school in the middle of London. I suspected my parents' choice of an all-girls school was influenced by my principal in Singapore, who thought I needed more discipline. Each morning, we walked through an underground tunnel to get to Hendon Central tube station. The walls and ground were covered in graffiti and gum, and the stench of urine hit our little noses. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. The first time we went through this tunnel was when I realised how sheltered our lives on the sterile shores of Singapore had been. There, gum was prohibited by law, and the thought of anyone urinating in public was horrifying. We hadn't appreciated how clean Singapore was. The school teachers met my sisters and me before the new school year began. The head of fifth form, years 9 and 10, Mrs Higgins, was a plump woman with thick spectacles and hairs on her chin. I would be taking the British GCSE exams in two years' time, and she wanted to confirm my subjects with me. English, science, mathematics, and a humanities subjects were compulsory. I decided to continue learning French and music for my elective subjects. I didn't want to take Japanese, but Yoshiko and Mrs Higgins had decided it would be silly for me not to. I knew that as a fluent speaker, I would find the subject too simple. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to study something interesting. But Japanese would be a guaranteed A-star grade. Besides, the teachers were concerned about my command of English given that I'd come from this little island called Singapore. They were keen on selecting the right subjects for me to ensure that school would uphold its academic standing. I'd like to study modern history as my humanity subject, I said. Modern history is quite difficult, replied Mrs Higgins in deliberately slow English. You know, as you've come from Singapore, you might find that you need to be quite good at English to study history. There's a lot of reading. I wanted to say, but English is my first language and I love modern history. But my parents were flanked on either side of me and I didn't want to talk back to my new teacher. Why don't you study geography instead, suggested Mrs Higgins. 
Higgins, and perhaps art as your other elective subject. Yes, I think that's a very good idea," agreed Yoshiko. "Do you like art?" asked Mrs. Higgins, still speaking slowly at me. "Yes, I love art," I replied. "Good, good. You don't really need to speak English for art." That's all we have time for tonight. Thanks so much to our wonderful writers, and thank you for joining us at home. A huge big thank you as well to the team at Emerging Writers Festival and, of course, at the Wheeler Centre. Our next big thing events take place every month, normally at the wonderful Moat Cafe downstairs here from the Wheeler Centre, and it really is the place to be if you want to hear great emerging writers reading from new and adventurous work. The Emerging Writers Festival is, of course, on now and continues until this Saturday, the 26th of June. And there's still so much to discover as part of their digital program. You can check out all the details at emergingwritersfestival.com.au. Thanks again, and have a wonderful night.